Friedman is really the father of modern American cryptology. This is somebody who had a direct effect on the winning and losing of war. Friedman's role in breaking the Japanese Purple Code is one of the great secrets of the 20th century. There's almost no area of modern life that isn't somehow touched on by the developments that Friedman is involved in. It was something about his brain that allowed him to look at code and see plain text. This is somebody who, who created a vocabulary, who stabilized a science, who invented new ways to approach the way in which uh, secret meanings work. He was a man who believed in precision and doing things right and doing the right thing. He lays the foundation for everything that has been achieved to date and needs to be remembered for that. William Friedman was born in Russia in the late uh, 1880s. His parents immigrated to the United States because of the pogroms in Russia. They were, they were Jewish. And uh, they came and settled in Pittsburgh. And that's where he grew up uh, with his brothers and sisters. And then eventually um, went to college at Cornell and then went on to his career. He then didn't set out, of course, to go into code breaking or code making although it was a kind of a different kind of code that he was interested in because he became a, a student in college and then as a graduate student in biology and in plant genetics. And he was hired by George Fabian to come to Riverbank Laboratories to work on crop propagation. And as far as I understand, he was hired as the head of a department of genetics at Riverbank Laboratories, which consisted of one person, William Friedman. Riverbank was on a river bank, as the name suggests, the Fox River in Geneva, Illinois. And it was a rural retreat. It was very much like what we would call in the Renaissance a villa. It's an agricultural and recreational complex with a serious, almost college structure attached to it with departments and deans and what the letterhead called a standing faculty. It was a lovely place, but it was run rather like a plantation. You, you lived in a, in a big house, or in the case of William Friedman, he lived in a windmill. Um, and, uh, and they met for, you know, meals, and there was a place to swim, and you could take long walks in the woods. Uh, and uh, they, they would leave little pitchers of ice water by the bed at night and fresh flowers in the room, but you were paid a pittance. A Fabian was eccentric, I think, to say the least. George Fabian was a very wealthy man who had deep and quirky interests and he invested in what he thought were the most interesting kind of cutting-edge subjects that were out there and created what we would probably now call a private think tank uh, around a couple of areas. One area was acoustics research. The other area was ciphers and specifically the Shakespeare authorship controversy. And he hired and supplied an entire uh, team, technical support team, for someone named Elizabeth Wells Gallup, who was extremely uh, compelling in her arguments for there being uh, cryptic evidence or cryptographic evidence that Francis Bacon had written Shakespeare's plays. However crazy in a way, especially in retrospect, the work looks, there was a deep interest in how communication works, in how technology works, uh, in how you could transform one thing into another. These are the deepest questions, I think, in some ways that science has to pose. Friedman was not hired at Riverbank to work in cryptology, and there two lines of thought as to exactly how he came into it, that he, that he naturally got interested in it from exposure to it at, you know, his fellow employees. But the story we tend to believe most is that 
he met Elizabeth Smith, who was one of the young women working on the project, and fell in love with her, and then fell in love with her work. There's this beautiful document that's in Elizabeth's papers that describes the first day they worked together and how William Billy, she called him, uh, was, was watching her as she was working. And a, pa a paper flutters over, she says, and she read it and it said, you are the most beautiful woman in the world or something like that. And in the diary, there's still that torn little sheet of paper with his writing that says, you know, how beautiful you are. And that just gives you this sense of the environment that drew them together. If you look at the pictures of Elizabeth and William Friedman when they are at Riverbank, you, you come up with a, a, an image of the halcyon days of yore, people tripping through fields of waving grain or flowers, uh, holding hands, uh, wearing clothing that goes from their neck down to their ankles, high button shoes, spats, um, summer frocks, uh, we only have, of course, their description of, of what it was like, but it seems all terribly romantic. It was before the war. Uh, people were seemingly more naive in those days. They met, their eyes locked. They fell in love, and they bicycled around together at Riverbank, you know, sitting on the side of the river having a picnic. Uh, it, seems, it does seem terribly romantic um, and innocent. And they married there, and they... Um, you know, began a family. You know, you've got everybody from uh, Freud, uh, Mark Twain, Helen Keller even, getting obsessed with the idea that somebody else has written Shakespeare's plays. So the two different approaches are biographical and cryptographic. Well, the people at Riverbank Laboratories were the leading advocates of the cryptographic line of inquiry. So Elizabeth uh, Wells Gallup, a Michigan school teacher, uh, becomes highly successful as an advocate of a Baconian cipher running through the works of Shakespeare. Now Francis Bacon was the first author in English to write an account of how ciphers work. And he produced a really powerful and subtle system, the Baconian biliteral cipher, it's called. It's the technical term for it. And basically, she became convinced that you could find the Baconian biliteral cipher running through Shakespeare's works, and that if you read them properly, they would reveal the secret message that Bacon was indeed the author of the plays. Well, that took considerable technical uh, and technological and philological expertise. And so uh, that's what Fabian is providing for her at Riverbank. It makes Riverbank unique in that it becomes really the largest pool of people in the United States on the brink of World War I where they're studying cryptology. The Freedmans were at Riverbank when World War I broke out. And as the, this pool of people who knew something about codes and ciphers, and there weren't many people in the U.S. military who knew about codes and ciphers, Fabian volunteered the laboratories as a training camp for officers who would be going into the Signal Corps and the Code and Cipher Service. They were both people who were going to be encoding and decoding things and people who are going to be breaking codes. Friedman and his team created really a curriculum, a proper curriculum, printed with Riverbank stationery uh, letterhead on it, exercise numbers, that sort of thing. And that grew straight out of the work that they had done in uh, educating people on the Baconian controversy on Bacon and Shakespeare. Friedman very much wanted to enlist and to go overseas and to work with the army itself. Fabian didn't want it to happen. According to Friedman's side of the story, and that's the only side we have, um, they had uh, a, a nephew of Fabian who was in the army, was an army doctor, declare Friedman 4F so that he wouldn't be 
drafted. They, they claimed he had a heart problem. Later, as it turned out, he didn't. Um, and he only found out about this and then later was able to discover that the Army had been requesting him to be sent, um, uh, to be commissioned and be sent overseas. So eventually, uh, he made direct contact with the Army. They um, took him in and uh, commissioned him, and he went over to the headquarters, the general um, of the uh, American Expeditionary Forces in Europe, and became the, uh, the, one of the chief cartographers. But it took a long time. It took at least a year and a half to two years before that happened. It could have happened a lot sooner, and he felt that his contribution to the war um, could have been much greater uh, had, had Fabian not blocked his way. By 1921, Friedman had been hired by the Signal Corps as a contractor, essentially, and then he eventually becomes a government employee to build codes and ciphers for the U.S. military. In the 1920s, William is the sole cryptologist. He is essentially the NSA of the 1920s, aside from the Black Chamber, working for the military, mostly building codes and ciphers, investigating machinery for codes and ciphers, things that are proposed. I think it was Lambros Kalimahos who would eventually say of Friedman, he was like Midas, except that everything he touched turned to plain text. Um, you know, he just had a facility for this, and he gained a lot of expertise in this time in the 20s, built up his rep with the military and, you know, built on his connections and made a real solid career. So I think that the 20s make him ready to take on the leadership of the SIS in 1930. He's put in charge of, it's a small group, it's probably no more than 12 or 15 people until 1937 or so, 38. And they're just investigating all sorts of different things. Um, he was very focused on training. He spent a lot of time, his first hires in the 30s, he put them in the vault, which was really like a bank safe vault in the munitions building to study the most secret of documents and codes and ciphers and really learn what they were doing before they started doing things. I think this was ticking along very nicely. There starts to be the idea of setting up radio intercept in the mid to late 30s as we start confronting the idea that we'll be at war with Japan at some point. And they start learning how to do, they're not actually doing that, but to take that intercept and break those codes and ciphers. It's a very different world than it would become in World War II. It's still a craft operation rather than an industrial scale operation and they build up a lot of experience. The book famously calls him the man who broke Purple. The remarkable thing I find about Purple and the whole team effort is that the U.S. had no idea what the machine looked like. All we had was the intercept. And they built what they call the Purple analog machine where you type in the intercept on one end, and it would print out the plain text Japanese ready for a linguist. This is very different. The only fragment of a purple machine the U.S. ever saw was found in the basement of the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, or the Japanese Embassy in Berlin, excuse me, at the end of World War II. And it looks so similar to the analog machine. It's amazing that these minds were just able to figure it out from just the intercept as a mathematical, inspirational effort that I'm sure Friedman guided and couldn't have happened without his guidance and training and inspiration. And the scale of mental exertion involved in what he did and what his team did around the breaking of the Japanese code were given a pattern of gibberish you're able to reconstruct the machine that must have produced it. Just knowing the pattern, that's mind blo literally mind-blowing, and I think it did blow his mind. <laughs>
In the months leading up to breaking the code, uh, Friedman had a nervous breakdown, which gives you an idea of how hard he was working and, and how seriously he took his task. But he came back, and they worked on it, and they cracked the code. Later in his career, and in fact, even closer to that event, people in the government accused William Friedman of discussing what he did with his wife, because she was a cryptographer also. And to the end, she said that the day they cracked purple, he never said a word to her about it. He never mentioned it. He just came home like it was any other day, said, what's for dinner, honey? And they sat down and had a meal that she didn't know what he did. His relatives later asked him, and nieces and nephews asked him. Other cryptographers asked him. Uh, journalists asked him. TV interviewers asked him. He never said a word about it. He pointed to the 18 volumes of the Pearl Harbor uh, report and said, it's all in there. After the war, you know, there were some dismissals and downsizing, and then it was realized how we need, we need to hire some of these people back, and it gets to be a bigger and bigger organization, and it's decided that the Secretary of Defense has to be the executive agent, and that this is not an armed forces organization, this is the National Security Agency, and that happens in 1952. William Freeman, of course, was older than most of these people. He had served in the first two wars, so he was the, the grand old gentleman, um, and the way NSA was going, the way the United States government was going, the way the world was going, uh, was going to be considerably different than William Friedman knew. He was used to hot wars, good wars, where you knew which side you were on, and you didn't do things like spy on your enemies. In the 50s and 60s, you're dealing with a Cold War. Uh, we spied on allies. He didn't like the idea that we'd be, we would be spying on Britain. Um, he had a hard time resolving the fact that you would give lie detector tests to people at NSA or the CIA. He lived in a world of gentlemen who trusted each other. I think he sees himself falling by the wayside a little bit. It has turned into a bigger bureaucracy. He really wrestled, I would say, particularly late in his life, with the ethics, something that is very much in the news right now. Friedman wrestled with the ethics of secrecy in a democracy. I think Friedman felt that there was a need for cryptography, there was a need for secret communication in governmental contexts. There was also a need for the kinds of other technologies and skills that come out of cryptographic work. I think he felt that quite profoundly, but he, I think he also felt that by the 1950s, he felt it had gone too far. And I think the response that he had in particular to the searching of his own library, to the kind of uh, McCarthyite climate on Capitol Hill where he lived and worked by the early 50s, I think he was very uneasy with that. His relationship to the organization, uh, he, he was being moved out. Um, and uh, while they appreciated his, his expertise, his view on how the world or the NSA should be run probably uh, didn't drive with the way it was, it was going. When William Friedman died, uh, his wife uh, decided to sell the collection, uh, to, to find a place they could keep it intact. And that's very hard these days because if you give it to a university library, they tend to break it up and put it in different places. The, uh, they approached the Marshall Library. Forrest Pogue was willing to, uh, to buy it and uh, put it in a special room upstairs where the collection is there in its entirety with uh, a table at which William Friedman worked, his name, uh, plaque, and portraits of the Friedmans on the wall. And so uh, somebody could walk in and basically feel that they were in the second floor library of William Friedman. Um, as it was when he was collecting it. He had this wonderful collection. He was such a collector of things about cryptology, and he didn't care if they were originals or not. He would take copies, but he just wanted the information. He wanted to know everything. He wanted, you know, to understand this field he helped develop. I think this library gives us an enormous amount of material to help us think about the role of secrecy in a modern democracy. It poses the, the, 
the life of William Friedman, and in fact his own struggles with the culture of secrecy that he helped to create, that he helped to found, give us new perspectives and new materials for thinking about whether it really makes sense. What do we need secrecy for? In what contexts? Where do we draw the line? Where, who's looking after? Uh, you know, who's, who's watching the watchmen? I know he really admired George Marshall and believed in him and thought this was the perfect place for his legacy.